We have assumed that, okay, microbes are there to digest our food, which is true. They have um, thousands of chemicals that our body doesn't have itself in order to break down food and extract the nutrients. We know that from mouse experiments, if they take away the my the microbes make them sterile, those mice have to eat like 30, 40 percent more every day just to stay alive because they don't have those careful processes. So it'll, life would be a struggle, but I think it's the new science is telling us that the immune system is the key to why we need a gut microbiome to be healthy because 70% of our immune system is in the lining of our guts and that's interacting with our microbes. So our microbes are essentially mini pharmacies pumping out chemicals that are interacting with all those cells as immune cells and that's priming them so they know whether to attack things or to defend things or just to get it right. And when it goes wrong, that's when you get food allergies, that's when you get autoimmune diseases, that's when you don't detect early cancers, and that's when you don't repair some of the processes of aging. So increasingly, you know, we're expanding our view of what the microbiome does from a rather limited idea of, oh, it helps break down food and it's quite useful for our energy balance and our metabolism to a much broader idea of what they we all really do, which is we're starting to see in some areas like cancer and immunotherapy, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's why everyone needs to know about the gut microbiome and everyone really needs to know that it's not just about how we break down food. It's absolutely crucial and that's you know explains a lot of the Western epidemics of chronic disease that as we've lost our gut microbes over the last 50 years, we've also gained all these diseases, all these allergies, all these immune problems, and we're you know, facing this pandemic of ill health. So by understanding the gut microbes, we can get back on track and really start to get back to our original, where our set point of health. And to do that, we need a healthy set of gut microbes. And I will actually also add the brain, no? because there is the gut-brain axis. Microbes are connected with our brain through chemicals, through neurotransmitters that are produced. And uh, so there is a connection between our gut and our brain. So even more functions. Yes, they actually produce the neurochemicals to make these key uh, differences between us being happy and sad, depressed or anxious. And we're only just discovering all the, those intricacies there. So, they, so yes, they're key to virtually all the bits of our body and we ignore them at our peril. I always love hearing <clears throat> Tim and Nicola talk about this because you come away just thinking how amazing it is and, and how important it is and of course how you know new it is as well and I think we can explore a bit today sort of the things that, that people are coming, uh, starting to understand. Um, before we do that, just can you help us to understand like how many different bacteria and other microbes are there in our gut? Well, Nicola might have a different number to me because everyone you ask can't really give you an exact figure for this. But there, in total numbers, there are hundreds of trillions, okay? So they're uh, of bacteria, but there are also another related species called archaea, which we don't talk about much because we don't know as much about them. Then we've got five times as many viruses, little mini viruses called phages, which eat the bacteria. And within all that lot, we've got fungi, we've got yeasts, and we've even got parasites, which you know we're starting to find are of great interest, and some of them are even healthy. So we've got this menagerie, if you like. It's like a, a jungle out there of lots of predators, eating each other, controlling each other, struggling for survival, whilst we're um, you know, little ones, big ones, uh, fat-eating ones, protein-eating ones, sugar-eating ones, uh, fiber-eating ones, and they're all in this these ecosystems struggling for survival. And as they eat the food, they're pumping out all these incredible chemicals that are used by our body, our immune cells, and you know, our health. So it's, it's, you've got to try and envisage this as this, this living community of microbes working together and totally dependent on the food that we give them. And I think that's, that's really important, which sets their environment.
And if we get that wrong, then environment shifts and those populations shift, just like you know, if there's no rainfall in a forest or you spray pesticide all over it, you're going to get a very different environment. Everything from the tiny insects to, you know, the the lions and the the big beasts. They're they're all all inside inside our gut, and everyone has a very different community. We're all totally unique. And Nicola's done this work on not only the sp- the species, but also the the strains. So within each species, there are subtypes called strains, where just a little tweak of the the DNA makes it quite different, have a different function. And so we're seeing even greater diversity than we imagined because of the new, these new techniques. Yeah, so there are probably thousands of different species in each of us, no? but not all are the same. Uh, so me and you, Tim, may, we may have only maybe 30, 40% of the species in common. And as you said, uh, these the strains that count is, is like COVID. No? We know there are many, many different variants and COVID has been around uh, three, three years, more or less. Uh, our gut microbes are around since hundreds of thousands of years. And so they have uh, spread a huge amount of different variants. And uh, it's very likely that you and me, they don't, we don't have even one variant in common. So very, very diverse, very different microbes. And we've all got, isn't it true that we've all got some variant of a bug that virtually nobody else has exactly 10,000 yeah. people or something uh, uh, we know that our human genome is unique but our human microbiome is even more unique that is really you know personalized to each of us it's amazing so you're saying that if i think of your jungle analogy you know you might, we might all have an orangutan inside us but actually it's a completely different variety of orangutan like you know the one that might be in indonesia and one that's you know i don't think they have one in africa my analogy has broken down but you're saying that actually when you really go down to understand it really each of these is yep. is, is different even though at the high level description of it as a type it of bacteria don't, might be they the don't same. just look different they are different they eat different uh, food that they they produce different chemicals. So very diverse within the same species. Amazing. So I think we're getting a picture of like this incredible complexity. And also, um, I love this jungle analogy and the idea that the food we're eating might be a bit like pouring pesticides or I'm thinking a bit about Brazil, you know, burning parts of it down or, you know, it's, it's a slightly scary analogy you've also set up there, Tim. Um, I do want to talk a bit about testing um, in this context because, you know, I think most people listening to this, they're used to this idea of maybe regularly testing their blood pressure when they go and see their doctor or probably used to the idea of having, you know, things tested in their blood regularly, like their cholesterol, all these sorts of things. These, these have become completely normal for maybe like 100 years, right, in, uh, in the West. I think most people are not used to the idea of measuring their poo, right? That seems like quite radical. Why would we want to measure our, our microbiome? Well, there are a number of reasons. I mean, the first is that if, if I get a sample of, say, your microbiome and a, and a sample of your DNA, and I do sequencing on both, I can tell much more about your current state of health from your microbiome than I can from your DNA. And this is coming from me as a ex-geneticist, okay? So I've totally changed my views on that. So the microbiome really says, what's your current state? It doesn't necessarily predict, you know, 50 years' time like, like DNA might, but it gives you a much better idea of your current health and also, an idea of your the state of your diet, whether your diet is appropriate for your microbes and whether it's pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. I think one question, though, that I think I immediately had when we first started talking about this um, probably six years ago, I think many people have, is around whether this can change. Because there's one thing which is, hey, I've got this measure like my DNA, it tells me some things which often feel a bit depressing, right? Like it's saying, hey, I've got this high risk for uh, you know, getting breast cancer, for example. And that's actually, you know, it sort of is a bit depressing if you feel you can't do anything uh, about it. And um, you know, one of the things that was exciting, I think, about the, the idea of the gut microbiome is the idea that it might actually be able to change. And we actually did a, um, we actually asked our community on social media um, uh, a question in, in preparation for, for this podcast about how quickly they thought uh, somebody can change their, their gut microbiome. And we had many thousands of responses. And interestingly, 50% said they thought that you could change the gut microbiome within a week, 31% within a month, and 18% 
uh, it would take six months. So like, to what extent can we change our microbiome? And what does the latest science tell us about how quickly you can start to see a change? I think they are all right, actually. Okay, <laughs> well done, everybody. There are multiple scales now. So uh, what I eat today will change my microbiome tomorrow, for sure. Uh, but it's also what I ate for the last 10 years that are changing in a more radical way the microbiome they have today. So it's a combination of the short-term diet and the long-term diet uh, and also the lifestyle. And uh, that is what is really exciting though because is uh, the fact that we can mod change our microbiome at multiple levels and uh, the uh, challenge here is to understand in which direction we need to move it, which microbes we need to improve and which food uh, we need to improve certain microbes. This is the real challenge today, and it's only with uh, big data, actually, a lot of uh, information from a lot of microbiome sort of people and uh, health information and diet information that we can, you know, un study everything together and pinpoint uh, what, which are the reproducible uh, changes uh, that we see and we can then tell uh, people to do. And the, the other point, I think, is that if your, your gut is in a bad way, then actually by radical change to say you're on a junk food meat diet and you change to a vegan diet, you see dramatic changes within five days. And the opposite is also true. So I think there are these extremes that if you um, have a very poor diet um, or a very um, good diet and you, you, you swap to the extremes, you will definitely see effects within a few days. And that's been proven uh, with, with some very carefully done studies. Um, it's harder to change someone who's on a really good diet to improve them than it is to improve someone who has a very poor, very non-diverse uh, inflammatory diet. So I think there is this variation, these timescales we've talked about, but there's definitely a large proportion of the gut microbiome that is very changeable, very amenable, and very unlike your genes, which... Uh, you really can't do much about at the moment, apart from just blame your parents. <laughs> and I blame them for a lot already. So, <laughs> and I think there are two levels here, no? Because one thing is that with our food we can increase or decrease uh, microbes that we already have, but we can also in, um, acquire new microbes, and uh, the microbes then can colonize ourselves depends on what we eat. So. Uh, but, uh, you know, if I change my diet today, I cannot uh, immediately acquire new microbes. I need both uh, acquiring microbes and finding the right uh, uh, food for, for, for them. So, again, it's a combination of two and not to always say the same thing, but it's more complex than what we currently appreciate also. And uh, uh, only with the big data, we can really understand it more. I think one of the things I've discovered over the last six years is always these things are more complicated as you get deeper into them than they appear on, on the outside. And Tim's smiling here because I think that's uh, the history of, uh, of his career. Um, I actually have my own personal experience here, which, which is quite fun. So I first had my microbiome tested in 2019, so uh, four years ago, as part of the very first Zoe um, Predict study. And at that point, I hadn't made any changes to my diet. I thought I'd been eating pretty healthily. I subsequently discovered it really wasn't that healthy, but I thought so. Uh, and I scored 52 out of 100 uh, in terms of the the, um, uh, the Zoe um, uh, gut microbiome score, which is basically completely average in the UK. So sort of 50 is sort of sort of the average score. Um, I've had it tested repeatedly since then. At the end of last year, I scored 78 which put me in the top well quarter of people. Thank you. So I'm very proud about that. Um, but I think what's interesting is I was able to make a really dramatic change uh, in my microbiome over those four and a half years. And it clearly took time to achieve this. Um, and so, you know, in my own you know, particular example, it wasn't a sort of transformation that happened uh, in a week. I wasn't eating a sort of a, an all junk food diet, but I clearly also was not eating, you know, I've made very big changes with Zoe. Um, I know we have very little data of people's microbiome over time because actually almost nobody was having their microbiome tested properly with this this thing we'll talk about in a minute, the shotgun sequencing. But you know, we've got two of the world's experts on the microbiome in the room right now. Do you do you think that might be typical? What what would you what would you guess? You really need uh, to change uh, the environment in your gut uh, to make uh, new uh, strains. Uh, uh, finding the, the, the new home. So, uh, yes, also because I think we need to think about the microbiome as an average, no? because 
we cannot really measure every minute of our microbiome for a lot of reasons. So it's the average uh, of, of what uh, you ate in the last year. Um, and, and I think uh, uh, that's really the time frame we, we, we need to test ourselves on. Yeah, every six months or so, we should see the improvement if we are changing our diet. If we change it tomorrow, we see uh, a difference. Uh, uh, sorry, if we change to today, we see the difference tomorrow, but then we change again and again. So it's really probably over a few months that we can see the improvements. And yeah, you did great. Uh, and uh, I, I think uh, you did some you know, substantial change in your diet then. Yeah, so I think, you, I think you're a bit slow, Jonathan. You should have uh, sped it up a bit, you know. Four years, come on, you can do better than that. So I think, um, you know. I may not have been the perfect student. So. Yeah, and if, you, <laughs> if you'd followed my advice, you'd have definitely improved in six months. And I think that's what really we should be seeing. For, the, for everyone who isn't sort of really high, I think that goes back to the point, the better your microbiome is, the, the more stable it is, the harder it is to make it better or worse because it's such a really tight-knit community, it's working so well together, it fights off other guys and doesn't like to, uh, to change. Whereas if you've got an unstable one, it's not very diverse, it's inflammatory, those are, the, those are the people that can really improve dramatically and probably in less than six months. So I think we're going to see an interesting picture here. And of course, you know, coming back to this is, you know, unlike everything else in the body, we're all so unique that just because it hasn't changed doesn't mean anything wrong. You might be someone that needs a longer time frame. Some people change faster. Some people change slower. Just like we react to drugs in our microbiome at much different speeds as well. And, and to be clear, it wasn't that nothing happened for four years. I want to be clear. There was a sort of a sort of steady improvement through this period. I've been testing more frequently, more recently, as the costs have come down a lot. It was seemed quite expensive to start with, but now it's um, it's got much cheaper, which is fantastic. Um, so there was a sort of steady improvement through this. But what's interesting is like it's continued and it's been step by step and probably has followed behind some of the impact I felt in terms of energy and things like this were very fast, sort of losing some of these slumps. So it's interesting that there's definitely um, there's something here that's taken quite a, some period of time and other things we were seeing sooner. And I think this matches up to some of the latest data that the two of you have been looking at, right? There's some unpublished data um, that will be uh, coming out um, in a paper uh, soon, I'm sure, looking for the first time at what happens with repeat measures of people who are um, uh, following, in this case, the Zoe advice. Can you, can you share a little sneak peek for the listeners about what that's, um, what that's showing? Uh, yeah, I can, I can start off, Nicola can uh, add the details, but um, essentially we took people who adhered to an improved diet. So they were eating towards uh, gut-healthy foods, more fiber, more polyphenols, more fermented foods, less junk foods, etc. And we got improvements uh, after about I think it was between three and six months, about over 80% of those people uh, improved their global scores. And of course, lots of changes in individual microbes, which may or may not be significant, but we'd managed to um, Nicola and his team got together this this score that summarized these changes. And so really for the first time, we're, we're now confident we've got a scoring system that works um, to monitor people's change over time. And no one's managed to do this yet. Uh, it's very interesting in the literature. There's a whole dearth of these, these problems because it is so difficult to summarize not only the complexity of the microbiome, but also this incredible interperson individuality. But I think Nicola and his team have, have finally cracked this. And uh, by looking at you know, the 50 uh, healthy bugs, 50 bad bugs, that ratio, that is proving really consistent for us. And I think we've, we've suddenly um, got these exciting results, which mean we can start testing. You know, we know what success now looks like. So therefore, we can start to work out what works best for, for which people and how we can tweak our advice. Because until that point, we were floating a bit in the dark. 